Go. Right. Um, welcome everybody to this first of the Radical Anthropology Autumn Seminars. Um, and Radical Anthropology, for those who aren't aware, is perhaps the oldest, um, longest running evening class in the whole of London. Uh, it's been going virtually 40 years. Uh, it's been hosted in a whole variety of venues, including working man's clubs, pubs, community centres. In the last few years, we have been at the, um, found our home at the Anthropology Department of University College London. Um, but of course, in these circumstances, for the foreseeable future, we're going to be doing Zooms on, uh, online. Um, and we already were doing in the spring, but this is kind of our first full season autumn term. Um, but what that gives us the chance of doing is to bring in international speakers that we wouldn't normally be able to do. So in a few, uh, in a few uh, uh, weeks time, we have Brian Hare from um, Duke University, North Carolina, who's a leading uh, expert of evolution of cognition, um, author of, for instance, Genius of Dogs, who's gonna be talking to us on his recent book, Survival of the Friendliest. And we're also gonna be welcoming one of the major hunter-gatherer anthropologists, um, Nurit Ver David um, from Haifa University as well. Um, in fact, we've got several hunter-gatherer specialists who will be talking on it, questions of egalitarianism, sharing and morality, including Mona Finnegan and Jerome Lewis from UCL. Um, in addition to that, uh, we, we welcome, as always, Chris Stringer, um, one of the leading experts on fossils, uh, modern humans and Neanderthals in the world. We always have him in the autumn term of radical anthropology, and he's coming on um, November 3rd, I believe. Um, so yeah, book your ticket for that one because that, that'll be sold out pretty quickly. Um, we have Fabio Silva, archaeologist, uh, a skyscape archaeologist coming in just a few weeks. And one of the very interesting talks will be, or, or discussions will be, we're, we're offering a panel on the anthropology of the late, great um, David Graeber, who we were extremely shocked to lose early this month um, as both an anthropologist and an activist, a colleague and a comrade. Um, so we're gonna be running that session on October 20th. For the first few, uh, few talks, We've got RAG regulars, um, Chris Knight himself, the founder of Radical Anthropology Group, and I'm going to ask him in a minute to tell you more about uh, Radical Anthropology as such, and um, myself. Um, so after Chris does the first two, I'll do one as well. Um, that will give people who don't know Radical Anthropology Group so much a bit of, of the sort of background of our theories on human evolution, the evolution of uh, symbolic culture, in particular human origins. Um, so we have uh, muted people for, or asked people to mute for the time when Chris is speaking for about 45 or 50 minutes. And yeah, put on your videos if you like, um, but uh, well, we're over 50. If, we, uh, if, if the numbers go up, um, having too many videos may, may cause problems, but I think we're fine um, if you like to. Um, so I'm just gonna hand over to Chris now and um, We'll run for about uh, till about 20 past seven or something, um, then open up for questions and discussion. Okay, thank you. Okay, <coughs> thanks, Camilla. Just a technical thing. Yes, um, by all means, switch your videos on. <coughs> Let me just see. I, I should be fine. We've only got 50 people. So when we get 100, it's a bit difficult. But, but yes, you're right. Um, is it Mary Jane Rust? I, I do like to see your faces. It's much nicer. So... Um, so please, yes, please do put, uh, switch your videos on, including Camilla, why has yours gone off suddenly? Okay, so um, wonderful to see you all and um, to start this uh, syllabus, this term. Um, we are hosted, as Camilla mentioned, by University College London Anthropology Department, and we are kind of outreach for that department to the sort of wider world. Um, and, um, Anthropology, just I'm, I'm sure you kind of know this, but I'll just repeat it. Um, we, we, we only ask ourselves one question, just one. 
but it's a very, very big question. Um, what does it mean to be human? And in our attempts to address that question, we, especially here at UCL, University College London, we, we don't sort of, we don't fragment ourselves. We, we don't consider ourselves to be kind of uh, cultural creatures, but not bodies or humans, but not animals or present creatures, but not past ones. We, we, we think that to address the question, what does it mean to be human? We need to, we need to get the, the big picture together really. And so the, the three major ways we address that question, I'll just run through them fairly quickly. We can ask what it might mean to be a creature um, closely related to us genetically, like for example, a bonobo or a chimpanzee, kind of human, um, ex certainly extremely intelligent and a, and a close relative of ours. These are great apes and we're great apes, but maybe, you know, we, by, by living with great apes, by studying them, by kind of talking to them, we can work out what it is exactly which makes us different or makes them different from us. And of course, if you were a chimpanzee, I thought, I'm sure you'd think it the other way around. You'd think, well, we humans are a bit kind of rubbish. We, we have you know, very strange habits and we don't seem to make very loud noises when we communicate and all sorts of things. But we, we, can, get a, we can get a much better angle of what it means to be human when we ask what does it mean to be very nearly but not human. And so we do primatology. And many of us at, UC, at UCL over the years have, have, have made major gains um, on, on, in, that, in that respect, studying close. And, and of course, not just, not just, not, not just, not just apes or, or primates. We, uh, studying all kinds of creatures gets, gets us closer to understand what's special about our own species. Another way in which we can address the question is to ask what it might mean to be um, an australopithecine. That's a, an ancestral hominin, maybe living four or five million years ago, or maybe Homo habilis or Homo erectus or perhaps the Neanderthals. I mean, these are, these are kind of hominins, they're, they're ancestors of ours. But again, anatomically in modern Homo sapiens and all around the world, we're, we're, we're modern humans, Homo sapiens. Um, we, we, we're, we're clearly different, we've evolved and, and our cognition and our social lives and so on are evidently not quite what they might have been uh, half a million years ago. So we can, we can do um, archeology, span prehistory, we can do um, we can use genetics these days to work out quite a bit about our ancestors. And then finally, the most, the most um, probably the most familiar um, way of doing anthropology, and that's to ask, looking around the whole world, how many different ways are there of being human? Uh, how many different ways are there of respecting the sacred, of looking after children, of organizing sex, for example, or our, our sex lives? Uh, and again, it's just so important um, not to imagine that the way we do things, uh, I, I live in London, Rag is sort of basically London based, and it's just all too easy for people to think that the way we do things in this particular corner of the world is the natural way uh, to do things. And just one, one simple example, we often assume that a, that a child has got mummy and a, a mummy and a daddy, it's got two parents. Uh, there's an element of truth in that, of course, genetically it, make, it, makes, it makes sense. But in most of the world, before the rise of big cities, uh, and so-called civilizations, the kinship system that you'd have, the kinship terminology, and this applies to pretty much all hunter-gatherers that have survived to, to, the, to this time. There's not, there's not even a word you can use for mother, my mother, which doesn't also mean mother, sister, or, or any of the other um, kinship terms. And so a woman will, 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 will treat in, in, in language her sister as uh, herself, the principal of this uh, form of kinship called classificator kinship is the equivalence of siblings. And it really means that a woman will treat her sister's child as her own child. My sister's child is my child, at least, uh, at least in terms of terminology, but actually it's much, much, much more than that. And of course that means um, that a child has got a lot more freedom because if, if it's getting into trouble with one of its mothers, it can go and find another mother or another mother or another mother, and it's got a lot more choice. And that's just one, one, one feature where Aboriginal Australians, hunter-gatherers in Africa, they would think we're very impoverished. How can a, how can a, a child, have, you know, it's, just, it's an impoverished kinship system. How can it be possible for a child to have one mother, uh, one father? You know, that's a very strange way of doing things. Um, so, um, and, and of course, there are so many other things which we, we tend to think are sort of inevitable. We think it's inevitable to have an economy. Well, hunter-gatherers don't have an economy. There's not a separate thing called the economy. Um, you have 
you, 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 you play, you hunt, you gather, you, you sing, um, and you're kind of in charge of your life. And there's not a sort of autonomous kind of machine, the, the economy which sort of chunters away on its own, um, more or less incomprehensibly to most of us, and, and determines the ways in which we, 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 you know, we live. So for us in the radical anthropology, we've always thought the central task really in addressing what does it mean to be human is to join the splinters of science together um, while at the same time acknowledging that we scientists are human, we have emotions, we, we probably need to do a bit more dancing and singing together in order to really experience what it means to be human in a full sense. It's a rather shocking thing the way in which so many scientists sort of look externally at, um, at other people's and, and try to understand them that way. And it's not really what anthropology should be doing, although in, in many cases it has been. And in Raggett in particular, we've always thought of ourselves as doing what we call reverse anthropology. And that's in, that's in the context of the history of anthropology. Anthropology started as a colonial endeavor. Um, so the job of anthropologists was to kind of spy on other people, find out how they worked in order to control them, exploit them. That's, that was the basic idea of functionalism. You couldn't be an anthropologist, a professional anthropologist, without becoming part of the colonial regime where in Africa, for example, in the case of Britain. And then, of course, subsequently, uh, in the post-war period, uh, the, the post-colonial period, um, the, the sort of dogma has really been that we're into development. We're, we're, we're going to help these people um, by, by bringing them up to date. And, and what we've always said in the radical anthropology group is, yes, we're very much in favour of uh, development. Uh, we need to develop in the West. We have all kinds of ways in which we need people from other cultures to help us become morally developed, politically developed, socially developed, spiritually developed, all sorts of ways in which we in the West have been very much impoverished. We've got a vast amount to learn from other cultures about how to be human, how to look after an environment, how to respect other parts of nature. Uh, and of course, today, very much, we, we can see that we haven't been doing too well uh, in, the, in, those, in those particular respects. But the, the, the topic of, of this evening's talk, of course, is did matriarchy ever exist? And so when we're asking, what does it mean to be human? Inevitably, we come up to the question of sex and gender. And we ask ourselves this fundamental question. Is it natural and inevitable uh, that men should rule over women? Is patriarchy, is sexism, is that just part of the way humans are? Very much as it's part of our you know, species that we've got four fingers and a thumb on each hand. Uh, is it something which we can't really change? Have all societies been, um, in some sense, um, patriarchal? And of course, there's all kinds of reasons why you think it, you might think it, yes, it seems quite likely, really. I mean, men are slightly stronger than women. Women are tied down with childcare, for example, more, more likely to be tied down with childcare. I'm using these words on purpose, by the way, tied down. Um, whereas men are more like free to engage in other relationships, political relationships, form alliances, and, and through those alliances, end up dominating the more atomized and isolated uh, female members of, the, of, our, of our species. Um, so, and, and very often people, certainly in the West, it is very much kind of a, a sort of almost a scientific assumption that we've always been in some sense, uh, even, when we, even when you look at egalitarian societies, the, the argument is very often that, well, yeah, egalitarian for men, but there's never been a time when women had power, let alone let alone you know, more power than men. I mean, very few scientists have, have women even got um, equal power. So I'm going to start by saying that although that's, although that's the very widespread assumption, what's so interesting is that it's an assumption of us in the West and other cultures have actually the reverse assumption. There are far more societies, far more local societies and groups and traditions and cultures which actually look at things the exact opposite way round. And in fact, everywhere in the world where you have hunter-gatherers or horticulturalists, these are, these are people living before the development of, of, of cities, wherever you have a monopoly of male, like a, the male sex monopolizes power, monopolizes political, religious, ritual power, the men will conceive themselves as constantly under threat in order for men to wield power, to hold on to it, they've got to be constantly struggling against the natural superiority of women. And the, the belief in all those places is that women have 
unfair advantages over men. They're much more likely to connect up and use kind of unfair methods of rule. And invariably, these methods of rule, which are considered so unfair, uh, they're kind of witchcraft, they're kind of magic. Women, women aren't accused of using physical violence, but they're accused of using something very much more dangerous and powerful, a form of witchcraft. Um, and, uh, and, and, it, and this is, uh, as I say, it's the, the idea that women are more powerful by virtue of being female than men, more likely to be able to connect up, is actually a, a universal myth among people prior to the development of sophisticated systems of hierarchy uh, and state power. So what I'm going to do is begin with the topic. The topic is, was there ever a matriarchy? And just read out some indigenous myths which say, sure, there was. Uh, women used to rule the world. There was a time when women ruled the world. So I'll, I'll, I'll um, start with a few of these um, stories. Um, uh, okay, right. This is from Tierra del Fuego, the, Yaman, the, um, the uh, Yam, uh, Yamana people. The, and it's called The Origin of the Kina. In the beginning, women had sole power. They gave orders to the men who obeyed, just as women do today. The men took care of the children, tended the fire, cleaned the skins, while the women did no work at all. That was the way it was always to be. The women invented the great Kina hut and everything which goes on inside it, and then fooled the men into thinking they were spirits. They stepped out of the great hut, painted all over with masks on their heads. The men did not recognize their wives who, simulating the spirits, beat the earth with their dried skins so that the earth shook. Their howls and roars so frightened the men that they hid in their little huts. But one day the sun man, whose job it was to supply meat to the women's spirits in their hut, overheard the voices of two girls while he was passing a lagoon. Curious, he hid in the bushes and saw the girls practicing their spirit impersonations and washing off their paint. He confronted them insisting that they reveal their secrets, and finally they confessed. It is the women themselves who paint themselves and put on masks, then they step out of the hut and show themselves to the men. There are no other spirits in here. The sun man returned to the camp and exposed the fraudulent women. In revenge, the men stormed the Kina hut, and in the ensuing great battle, killed the women or turned them into animals. From that time on, the men have performed in the Kina hut. They do this in the same manner as the women before them. So we have this story about a, a hut, a large like women's house, women, an all women's hut within which women were exercising their, their, their unfair forms of power and, and ruling men through, 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 if you like, through religion, through asserting themselves as spiritual beings or, and or painting their faces, wearing masks, so that, Women's rule is a form of deception in this in that story. Now, what we now know is that, um, and we know this from Claude Levi Strauss, the great French structural anthropologist, that in order to understand myths, you need to take several variants of a myth. Um, and what you do is it's almost like having it's like slides, with each slide has got a small amount of the information you need. And you, you look through one, you put another one behind it, another one behind that, and you look through the different sides and you twist them this way and that way until you suddenly see a, a, a pattern developing through um, looking at the variants. So this was what Claude Levi-Strauss did with, with looking at a, a thousand myths from North and South America. And he ended up concluding that the, the, the myths of, of um, the first Americans are all variations of a theme and ultimately have one myth only. We've got one fundamental myth stretching right across those continents. And of course, it doesn't stop there. If Levi-Strauss is correct, right across planet Earth is a web of mythology. And these myths amount, uh, as so many different variations of a theme, they amount to a single myth. And uh, these myths I'm reading out now are undoubtedly variations on that theme. We're, we're looking at different versions of what is actually the same myth. And this is the myth uh, that women once ruled the world. So this is from the Meinaku, Amazonia, that's called the origin of the bull ruler. In ancient times, the women occupied the men's houses and played the sacred flutes inside. We men took care of the children then, 
We processed manioc for our wove hammocks, spent our time in the dwellings while the women cleared fields, uh, fished and hunted. In those days, the children even nursed at our breasts. A man who dared enter the women's house during their ceremonies would be gang raped by all the women of the village on the central plaza. One day, the chief called us together and showed us how to make bull roarers to frighten the women. Bull roarers are these slats of wood on a string. You whirl them round and round, and they make this terrifying woo, woo, woo sound, um, uh, like the sound of a sort of dragon or monster. Uh, as soon as the women heard the terrible drone, they dropped the sacred flutes and ran into the houses to hide. We grabbed the flutes and took over the men's houses. Today, if a woman comes in here and sees our flutes, we rape her. Today, the women nurse babies, process manure, flour, and weave hammocks while we hunt, fish, uh, and farm. So we're beginning to get a sort of picture of what's going on here. And um, the method which men use to rule over women is that they threaten gang rape. Um, and they kind of excuse themselves by saying, well, in the past when women ruled, the women used to gang rape us if we crossed the line and, and you know, went into their house. So you can see these myths are doing that. The justifications for the rule of men uh, and the argument of that myth and the, and the one beforehand, when women rule the world, it was chaotic and cruel. It was a, it was a, it was a female tyranny over us poor men who, who had to rebel uh, and, and eventually did uh, rebel. Okay, another one, the Munduruku, again from Amazonia, the origin of the sacred flutes. Three women were walking through the forest long ago when they heard music coming from a lagoon. They investigated and caught three fish, which turned into three sacred flutes. The women played these to produce music so powerful that they were unable to occupy the sacred men's house, forcing the men to live in ordinary dwellings. While the women did little but play on their flutes all day long, they forced the men to make manioc flour, fetch water and firewood and care for the children. The men's ignominy was complete when the women visited the men's dwellings at night to force their sexual attentions on them, just as we do to them today. However, the flutes needed feeding with meat. One day the men, who were the hunters, threatened to withhold what they caught unless the women surrendered the flutes. Frightened of angering the fertility spirits contained in the flutes, the women agreed, and the men seized the flutes and the tower, which they've held on to to this day. So we're going to move now to West Africa. I'm just going to take one. Uh, and this is the origin of the royal dress from the, from the Dogon. A woman stole a fibre skirt, which was stained with the world's first menstrual flow. So this was a red coloured, blood coloured dress stained with um, menstrual blood. Putting it on herself and concealing her identity by this means, she reigned as queen and spread terror all around. But then men took the fibres from her, dressed themselves in the royal garment and prohibited its use to women. All the men danced wearing the reddened fibres and the women had to content themselves with admiring them. And I think you're beginning to see now that this hut which the women occupied and from which they wielded power has got something to do with that special thing which women can do, which is to menstruate. And if you've got menstruation and you've got that color, it makes you powerful. And, and if men want to overthrow women, They've somehow got to get that particular power. They've got to have that red staining on their royal uh, costume. Reminds me, of, the, of course, of the royal purple. Okay, and we, so we're, 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 can you see what's happening? As we go through each variant, we get closer and closer and closer to what's going on. And by the time I've read the last one, which won't be for too long, um, it'll be very, very clear what this myth is all about, what it's really um, telling you. Um, this is from Papua New Guinea, the Kwavuru, the origin of the bull roarer, once again, Tivra, the originator, was puzzled to hear a faint sound, like that of a bull roarer, whenever his wife moved. He asked her what the sound was, but she pretended not to know. Eventually, Tivra felt sure that it was coming from her vagina, and he commissioned various birds to steal the object responsible. A number of birds swooped down on her while with bended back and legs spread wide apart, the woman was engaged in sweeping the village. But each time she frustrated them by abruptly sitting down, only the parrot got near enough to draw blood. That is why parrot's feathers are red. Eventually, Tiv called upon the little bird Serakuti and threatened him with death 
if he failed to obtain the sound making instrument. Tiv shouted to his wife, show a little bit more rigor with your sweeping. And as she bent down and the point of the bull roarer protruded from her vagina, the bird swooped down and snatched it away. The woman lay streaming with her first menstrual flow, while Tivra hugged the bull roarer to his breast and declared that henceforth it would belong to man alone. And that is really making the point that the bull roarer is the sort of sound of the blood and particularly the sound of the menstrual blood. It comes from it within women's vagina. That's why she had it first. It's quite difficult for men to seize it from womankind and hug it to his own breast. But this story explains how it all, um, all happened. Um, yes, I, I, can, I might as well read a couple more. So this is from the Umed of Papua New Guinea, the origin of Ida. In each case, we have, we have Ida, we have Hain, we have the sacred flute. We have these cults, if you like, these secret cults of either men or women. And every single time that the men's house, the men's hut, the associated men's cult, the story is we men stole all of this from women and women had, sort of, had, had a natural primordial ownership of these particular powers. Obviously, I'm directly connected with, with being female. One day the women who alone held the secret of Ida were preparing for a ceremony as usual, making and storing the materials, paint, masks, etc., in the sacred enclosure. But this time the men had decided to set a trap for them. They went hunting and killed so many pigs that when the women had eaten, they lay about in postures of repletion with their knees spread and their skirts out of place. The men copulated with the women who died, that symbolically died, that means that kind of translated as slept or fainted. While the women slept, the men broke into the sacred enclosure, stole the mask and began to perform either for the first time. We're no good, said the women when they woke up. We fell asleep. From now on, either belongs to the men. And that's telling you that the women when they had their power, they kept men out. They weren't going to be having sex with the men. But this time the men supposedly fed the women. They were too full. They, were, they, were, they fell asleep. Their legs were apart. The men um, had sex with them. And through having sex with the women, the, the women lost their solidarity, their power, um, their either. Um, uh, yes, OK. Um, I'll miss that one. This is from the Gimi, the origin of the sacred flute from Papua New Guinea. A woman kept the sacred flute under her bark string skirts until one day it was stolen by her brother. On putting the blowhole to his mouth, however, his sister's pubic hairs attached themselves to the man's face. This is why men today have beards. The loss of her flute caused the woman to menstruate for the first time. Ever afterwards, she was secluded each month in a menstrual hut. The men, meanwhile, began playing the flute inside the men's house and have held um, power ever since. I'm going to read two more, uh, just to <laughs> absolutely clinch it. Uh, the Ganao from West Sipic, Papua New Guinea, the origin of the moon. So we haven't really heard about the moon up to now, but we have heard about menstruation. Um, but of course, the word menstruation means moon change etymologically, and in every single culture of the world, a woman's menstrual bleeding each month is, is described in some sense as, I've visited the moon, the moon's my other husband, the moon's seen me. The, the moon and menstruation are intimate. If there's any like, metaphor around the world which is universal, it's this link, intimate link between menstruation and the moon. So, a woman caught the moon in her net while fishing in the river. Calling it a turtle, she hid it in her house under a pile of firewood, intending to cook and eat it later. She began to prepare the necessary sago, leaving her house each day with a moon in its hiding place inside. As she left, she barred her house, and each evening as she returned, she refused to let her husband come inside, instead making him eat his sago outside, always outside. He wondered why. One day, while the woman was out, her husband peered through a crack in the wall and saw the light of the moon under the firewood. According to his brothers in secret, he obtained their help in breaking into the woman's house. They stole the moon, singing. They pushed it up on a pole until it stuck fast to the sky. At this point, the woman was at work and saw the moon's image reflected in the red leech sago washings in her vat. Desperate, she rushed back. Discovering her loss, she cursed her husband. The men hunted by night 
killing phalanges and feeding them to the woman until her jaws ached. At last she made it up with the hunters and demanded no more meat. My grandchildren, she said, I was cross over my loss. I took all you hunted. From now on, you may eat the phalanges. So we've got a hidden moon and hit a moon has come down to earth. Well, that's clearly dark moon or new moon, isn't it? Um, the men can't hunt while the moon's down in the, in the darkness, but the men see it, steal it from the woman, put it up in the sky. Thanks to this full moon, they can now hunt by night and they, 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 yeah, they, 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 they perform the same trick with really. they, they give the women so many, so many, so, so much meat and their, their jaws ache. That's it. Okay. And now that just one, one last one, um, because, um, I just, I, there's, there's, there's one now which is um, really, um, this is um, the Baruya from Papua New Guinea. Um, and this one really clinches everything because it's, it was, it was, this was recorded by Maurice Godillier uh, in the mid eighties. And Maurice Godillier is one of the few uh, Marxist anthropologists, uh, very, very well-known French anthropologist. And he, he got very close to not just recording the myths, but understanding pretty much what, is, what these stories, all of these stories are all about. So the Baruya, the origin of the sacred flutes once again. In the dream time, the women one day invented flutes. They played them and drew wonderful sounds from them. The men listened and did not know what made the sounds. One day a man hid to spy on the women and discovered what was making these melodious sounds. He saw several women, one of whom raised a piece of bamboo to her mouth and drew the sounds that the men had heard. Then the woman hid the bamboo beneath one of her skirts that she had hung in her house, which was a menstrual hut. The women then left. The man drew near, slipped into the hut, searched around, found the flute and raised it to his lips. He too brought forth the same sounds. Then he put it back and went to tell the other men what he had seen and done. When the woman returned, she took out her flute to play it, but this time the sounds which she drew were ugly. So she threw it away, suspecting that the men must have touched it. Later, the man came back, found the flute and played it. Lovely sounds came forth, just like the ones that the woman had made before. Since then, the flutes have been used to help boys grow. Um, of course, the important thing to note here is that the flute had been stored by its owner under her skirt in her menstrual hut. And Maurice Godelier, who recorded this story, comments, the message of this myth is clear. And I'm agreeing here with, with Godelier, he's probably quite right. In the beginning, women were superior to men, but one of the men violating the fundamental taboo against ever penetrating into the menstrual heart or touching objects soiled with menstrual blood, captured their power and brought it back to men, who now use it to turn little boys into men. But this power stolen from the women is the very one that their vagina contains, the one given to them by their menstrual blood. The old women know the rough outlines of this myth and relate it to young girls when they have their first period. And um, anyone who's familiar with other fairy tales from around, around the world will know that what happens for a man to become powerful is he has to do some extraordinarily brave thing. He has to enter into some kind of monster, some dark place and battle. And the hero of this story, the reason why he's such a brave hero is because he dared to go into this extraordinarily dangerous place, a woman's menstrual hut, because of course the belief in this culture, so many other cultures, is that um, menstrual blood has got this terrible power. A man goes anywhere near it, it will destroy his, the potency of his weapons, his penis will shrivel up, he will suddenly you know, race through the, you know, the, the decades and become an old man. Menstrual blood is the most terrifying thing, and yet this brave man d did the sort of inconceivable. He managed to invade a woman's menstrual hut, find the magic, uh, and come back with it, and then give it to um, give it to, to his own sex, giving it to, to men. Right. So, I mean, I certainly don't want to say that um, myths are um, true. They're certainly not true. This is quite clearly male ideology. Um, but what is true is that in those, um, in the rituals which men perform and which they explain by reference to these stories, uh, men actually do steal exactly that same kind of power from women. So around the world, we have these institutions called 
men's houses. So Papua New Guinea, Amazonia, parts of Africa, the most splendid building, the most marvelously beautifully adorned and massive building you'll find is the men's house. Um, and in the men's house, what men do is they menstruate. They, and what they also give birth. And of course, as soon as you think about that, you'll think, well, that's not really possible, is it? Men can't menstruate and they can't really give birth. But um, actually, men kind of can menstruate. I, I actually was first confronted with a strange fact that men menstruate, and they menstruate in traditional cultures wherever the men have the, the monopoly of ritual power. It was actually Mary Douglas, my tutor at the time at UCL in the 70s, she gave a lecture on all this and her lecture was on a book called The Island of Menstruating Men. Um, and uh, I, I won't go into the whole lecture or the story in any great detail, um, but the island is called Wageo. Um, and what happens is that a man who's feeling a bit lethargic, a bit weak, things aren't going too well, doesn't seem to have any energy. What he does, he goes down to the seashore and he pulls up his penis, he gets a crab's claw or some other sharp um, claw shell and rips the sharp edge of it right up at the underside of his penis. Uh, lots and lots of blood has to pour out into the water. He does this at new moon and he feels wonderfully refreshed and renewed, partly because he kind of blames contact with the other sex for the fact that he's feeling lethargic. Now, once you're menstruating, you keep the other sex away. So the man who's, had, who's got a bleeding penis, he, he's free of sex for quite a while. Um, and that's great because um, illness comes from conjunction with the opposite sex, kind of at the wrong place and the wrong time. Um, so anyway, um, Mary Douglas taught us all this and we were all kind of shocked. Sort of, if we were men, we were sort of holding our knees together and feeling a bit uncomfortable about it all. But it really quickly came, became clear to me, as, as, it, as Mary Douglas knew, that it's, it's kind of normal in a men's house for men to menstruate. Um, they cut their penis, they cut, or they cut their, their arm, or they, they shove um, sharp uh, grass up their nostrils and down into their, uh, into, down their throat and you know, pull the sharp uh, grass up and down. And they do that in order to menstruate. And also they give birth and what they do, and they, and they call this initiation, but, they, but, but you know, the, what they do is they take boys, they have an argument that women only give birth to flesh. Uh, and in order to be properly born, a boy has to be born a second time, and only men can do this proper birth, this second birth. So the boys take the raw material from the women, the boys, um, and um, the, the whole process of initiation is a terrifying one for the boys. They kind of die. It's, it's terrifying psychic death that they go through, as well as bleeding. And, and they're, 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 they're kind of taught how to bleed through uh, sub incision or some other form of cutting. And then, after a long, quite a long ritual, the boys now reborn are giving back to their mothers. Uh, and of course the, the ideology here is that um, women just give birth to flesh and soul and spirit is something which men have to be responsible for and they do that through, through this um, second birth. Now I've got a, a book here um, and it's called The Creation of Inequality. I don't know if you can see it here, The Creation of Inequality, am I getting it near the, the screen? <laughs> It's uh, Kent Flannery and Joyce Marcus, how our prehistoric ancestors set the stage for monarchy, slavery, um, and empire. Uh, and if you go through this book, um, okay, on page 124 here, um, we've got a men's house, a, a, an archeological um, diagram of a men's house. This is a men's house with carved monoliths at Wadi Hamath uh, in Jordan. Um, I can go turn another page. And we find um, an, another men's house. This is um, a Gobekli Tepe, um, a, a men's house. I'm going to sort of show it to you here. Um, you go through another page, you find another men's house uh, here, uh, another men's house. I don't know. So I'm, I, the point I'm making, I won't go for you with all these different diagrams, but this is, this is called The Creation of Inequality. And you go through the book, and it's men's houses all the way down all the way down, all the way down, all the way down. And towards the end of the book, it explains how the men's house sort of morphs into a temple and then how the temples morph into our today's um, synagogues, uh, mosques uh, and churches. Um, and 
it's called the origin, the creation of inequality, but you're sort of asking yourself, well, it, it, it seems that inequality was always there. I mean, there's never anything before the men's house. The men's house is the oldest, apparently, proper building, and it's a men's house. It certainly isn't a women's house. Um, and um, you're, you're wondering kind of what's going on. And of course, the, the message of this book is that um, inequality, gender inequality, didn't really have a beginning because it was always there. And it's quite easy to make that argument because, of course, we're related to the chimpanzees, common chimpanzees, and they are very male dominated uh, in a chimpanzee social group. The males, well, every male is dominant over every female. Uh, the males quite often uh, coerce, sexually coerce the females. Um, it's, it's very easy to make an argument that males are more, more powerful than, um, than females in, in physical terms. And this book seems to be colluding with that basic idea. Now, the stories, of course, we've been reading out are, are making a different claim. They're saying the men's house um, was originally a women's house and not just a house, but a special house, a sacred house, a, a house with where secrets were, um, uh, you know, um, they were preserved by women. Um, and of course, you can ask, well, is it, are those stories, is there any truth in those stories? And the point I want to make now is that we can sort of forget the whole issue of whether or not those stories are historically true. The stories I'm talking about now, the stories which say that men robbed power from women who originally had it. And the point, the more, the more important point is that in those buildings, by bleeding and by giving birth to children in their own way. Um, and it's, it's, the, it's like the men know that they stole the power from women because they're doing it now. The whole purpose of those rituals is to, is to take what women do, which is to menstruate and give birth, disempower that activity and, t and assume that power of menstruation and cyclicity and, and, and birth uh, as something which men themselves um, can uh, monopolize. Um, the reason why, of course, the archaeologists don't find any archaeological evidence for the women's houses is because it's only when you get the men building these houses, and, and of course, in their terms, they've stolen them from the women, that they become permanent, um, solid dwellings likely to leave uh, an archaeological uh, signature. Um, but what I want to do is to um, um, just, uh, just show you actually that what's actually going on here is um, much more complicated than most of the, uh, of the series um, would, would lead, lead you to believe. Now, I'm going to show you a few slides a little bit later on. I, I find it easier to give the talk first and then we'll, we'll see some pictures. But you might ask, is it possible that the stories which say that women had a collectivity and a path through connection with the moon and connection with each other, is it possible that the, that, that aspect of the stories might have some uh, truth to it? Um, so there's a part of um, the Hindu Kush, a part of um, Pakistan in the north, in one or two very, very remote um, mountain valleys where I'm going to read out now from the, the work by an anthropologist, um, Wynne Maggie, where the main building in the village is a menstrual hut. So don't think that menstrual huts have to be isolating huts in a swampy part of a village where women are kind of shamed and forced to seclude themselves. It is perfectly possible for the, if you like, the temple to be a menstrual hut. So it was not until 2001, in fact, that a female anthropologist was able to show that menstrual synchrony and solidarity, or at least certainly solidarity, is to this day a living, thriving custom in at least one part of the world. So when Maggie wrote a book describing what happens regularly to this day inside the Bashali, a communal menstrual house used by women among the Kalasha people of Northwest Pakistan. 
The author was so surprised at what she found that she feared her Western readers might not believe her. And she explains, I don't want to make the mistake of leading you to believe that women always achieve mystic solidarity simply by virtue of sharing time in the menstrual house. Yet, one of the delightful things for me at least is that for a few days, women whose paths otherwise rarely cross find things in common. The Bashali is a place of intense physical intimacy where women share knowledge about their bodies that would be unthinkable uh, in everyday life. Women, when Maggie's book is called, Our Women Are Free, because this is something which men in this culture say of women. Women in the Kalasha Valley consider themselves free, whether married or not. Men are not just supportive, but proud of the fact that their women are free to travel, free once married to return whenever they like to the home where they were born, and most importantly, free to resist men's demands. In this community, there are no isolated menstrual huts. Instead, there is a large and well-built sacred building serving as a communal meeting house for the women who see it as the physical center for their solidarity and freedom. Women congregate here when menstruating or giving birth so that at any one time, there may be as many as 20 women inside, gossiping, laughing, singing together, many with their babies and toddlers. During their stay in what they call their most holy place, women compare notes on the duration of their menstrual flows. In the Kalasha Valley, where there are no men's houses or temples, the communal menstrual house is the most sacred building there is. And of course, as soon as you see this, you realize this communal menstrual house is um, the church or temple. Uh, which immediately shows where these churches and temples actually come from. It's giving you a bit of information that quite, is not absolutely conceivable that the myths we've been reading were saying that men robbed something from women that women originally uh, invented, namely getting together and shedding blood, that men really did somehow uh, take over that, um, that, that, that solidarity and, 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 and potency through having a cycle, through uh, menstruating. The Bashali building is off limits to men and provides a big period of refuge and reprieve extending over several days. Women who want to get away from their husband for a few days can use it as a refuge. Win Maggie even relates how a young woman who planned to elope used the excuse of menstruation as a pretext for leaving her family, confident in the support and solidarity she would find. She describes graphically how women enjoy the intimacy of sleeping in the Bashali, arms and legs wrapped closely uh, together. Uh, what happens in the Bashali is women's secret, so much so that men don't even have the words to ask what happens there. The greatest secrets are the words used to describe menstruation, intimate parts of the body, and details of female reproduction. Being an anthropologist, when Maggie compares these women's secrets and privileges with those so often monopolized by men in their so-called men's houses. Um, I haven't read too much about that region, but as I understand it, the, the whole of the Hindu Kush, that massive area of mountains, was once the territory of these, um, of these people. And so it would have been a very, every single valley, every single village in every valley would have had this, this temple within which um, women were intimate, which was forbidden to uh, men. Now, of course, these people aren't hunters and gatherers. So you might ask, well, what about hunters and gatherers? Because all of us at one stage, of course, were hunters and gatherers. There was a time 8,000, 8, 9,000, 10,000 years ago, perhaps a bit early in some places, when hunting and gathering was the only thing that humans did. And sometimes we were very successful at it. We were living in areas like Africa with enormous, um, massive uh, game animals and plentiful supply. Others, other areas possibly uh, more scarce. But hunting and gathering is... Is, this, is the way of life which constructed our nature. If you ask, what, what does it mean to be human? All of us are hunter-gatherers, even to this day. We've, we've not very well adapted to capitalism, of course. We've only had that for a few hundred years, but we haven't really adapted all that well to, to the Neolithic, to farming. Essentially, all of us humans, we feel freest and happiest and healthiest when we're with, with, with our equals, when we can laugh with each other, when we can share jokes, when no one's, no one's dominating us and we're not dominating anybody else. But although there's an element of competition in life, the most joyful thing is to sing together and play and lots of sex and lots of, and with women very powerful as well through their, their solidarity. 
So I just want to read out another, another example, this time from Colin Turnbull's marvelous book, The Forest People, and just say, if any of you are new to anthropology, <laughs> the place to start is The Forest People. It's a beautiful book, um, uh, and, and uh, it's about the, the Mbuti, um, so-called pygmy people of the Aturi forest um, uh, in, in Central Africa. And um, what the, 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 for me, at any rate, having heard from Mary Douglas about the island of menstruating men and all that stuff, for me, the, the interesting thing is that the forest people are hunter-gatherers living adjacent to farmers, to Bantu people. And, uh, and, and, uh, and so Turnbull describes how among the farmers, menstruation is a shameful um, thing. A, a girl feels embarrassed by her first menstruation and she's kept out of the way. There's all kinds of things which are, of course, familiar to us about menstruation being polluting and, and a kind of illness. But for the, um, for the Mbuti, it's the other way around. And Turnbull describes the Elima ritual, a girl's first menstruation ceremony, as one of the most joyful occasions experienced by the entire community. And he writes, I'll just read out a bit of this. So when a young pygmy girl begins to flower into maturity and blood comes to her for the first time, it comes to her as a gift, received with gratitude and rejoicing. The girl enters seclusion, but not the seclusion of the village girl. She takes with her all her young friends, those who have not yet reached maturity and some older ones. Together, they are taught the arts and crafts of motherhood by an old and respected relative. For the pygmies, the Elima is one of the happiest, most joyful occasions in their lives. And so it was with happiness that we all heard that not one, but two girls in our camp had been blessed by the moon. Now, I was mentioning that this book here, The Creation of Inequality, doesn't have any examples of women's, women's houses. Um, and of course, the reason is because the, the, these were the hunter-gatherers, at least, um, they're made of grass and there will be no archaeological trace. So, um, so with the onset of a period, the girl enters a large, specially built grass house, the Elima, accompanied by her young friends and supervised by an older female relative. And day after day, the women sing inside the house. From time to time, one or more will suddenly burst out to chase a boy, chosen from among the many likely to have gathered around. The girls carry saplings used to playfully whip their chosen boy. To be whipped establishes an obligation to visit the girls in the Alima house. Once inside, if you're a boy having been tapped with this sapling, there's no need to do anything further, but the young man is subject to considerable attention if he refuses. A boy who consents to sex inside the house cannot just leave. He must stay in the Alima for several nights until the festival is over. To prove himself fully acceptable, his final task will be to kill and bring home a large uh, antelope. So this is an example of female initiation it's kind of an initiation for the young boys, of course, but you can imagine the very different psychology, a sexual psychology of a boy whose first sexual experience was being jumped on by a pile of women in their own house than the other kind of psychology you have with your first sexual experiences in some symbolic sense, conquering the girl and her surrendering or consenting to have sex. This way is very much, um, of course, the other way, the other way around. Um, so, I mean, I, I, obviously I need to stop before too long. Um, I, the, the question I'm asking is, did matriarchy ever exist? And the answer is quite complex. It's yes um, and no. There was certainly never a time when women ruled men in anything remotely like the way in which men have been ruling over women for the last several thousand years and making a bit of a mess of things. So the, the, idea, that, the idea of the myth that women once ruled the world there is no evidence for it. And the reason is because the Alima that I've just described is a momentary, maybe it's several days actually, expression not... of women's rule. Women will rule for a, for a period, for quite a long period, maybe several days, maybe a week or so, maybe a little bit more. But then they, they joyfully give up and the men will have their own ritual. And the best example of all that, you're probably gonna hear about it later in this term from Jerome Lewis. Um, he's giving a talk um, about very similar people in many ways, the, the, um, the Benjeli or Bayaka people of, 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 the, of the forest of, of Central Africa. Um, and they have a, a women's ritual called Ngoku and a men's ritual called Ejengi. And Ngoku is a raucous invasion of the whole um, camp by a bunch of women who are 
assertively sexual, assertively proud of being female, sort of scaring the men and, the men and boys, kind of taunting them, insulting them in all kinds of ways, but in a playful way. And the men have to kind of put up with all this. Um, and the women um, take over the entire space. Um, and it's, it's, it's in, in so many different ways connected with the fact of being female. They celebrate their you know, child um, giving powers, their cyclicity, their menstruation. Women get initiated into, into Nagoku around the time of the first menstruation. But the, this is the crucial thing. This is the rule of women, this Nagoku, but it's followed by the rule of men and then followed by the rule of women. So what you have is a pendulum or a seesaw. And Mona Finnegan, who did field work in the same area and has done a lot of um, comparative research about hunter-gatherers across the whole of Africa, she has a term for this condition. So I'm asking the question, did matriarchy ever exist? And I'm saying no. But what did exist is what Mona Finnegan calls communism in motion. And communism in motion means the women take the power, having, a, having made their point, they surrender that power to the men, but the men aren't allowed to outstay their welcome. The men can do a jengi, and it's quite a masculine, you know, stamping, you know, lots of muscles showing we are, you know, <laughs> real men and the women, the women like that. Um, but, the, but the men mustn't outstay, outstay their, their welcome. And, and, and so what happens is you get the, 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 the goku, the women's, women's rule, if you like, then a period of just relaxed uh, everyday life, if you like. Then the men come in with a jengi for a few days, perhaps a week or so, um, and make their point. And then everything gets settled down into a normal life. And then there's another nagoku. And, and so it's a pendulum. Women rule, men rule, women rule, men rule. And the, the, I'm not saying, because there's not much evidence for it, I'm not saying that it's regularly linked these days to the lunar cycle. But there's no question that the symbolism is lunar. And there's no question that these hunter-gatherers that, that, that practice what we're calling communism in motion, for them, the moon is the main clock. I mean, it's, or perhaps I should say that they, they have a calendar which is um, solar and lunar. So, of course, the difference between the day and night and the difference in dry and rainy seasons is, is absolutely crucial. But the most central uh, clock governing ritual and whether or not you're hunting or not is um, the moon. And women say, and Jerome's going to be going into more detail about this, uh, men say women, of course, as well. Women's, hus women's biggest husband is, um, is the moon. And now I just want to end up this, um, this, this talk by just saying a few things about that, because uh, patriarchy has been so much part of our lives. We've so much internalized it that it's almost impossible for women these days to know that having a cycle could connect you to the wider world and give you the, the connection, the, the connection which actually gives solidarity and power on a monthly lunar basis. Now, I just want to go through a few things. Um, this, the, the, the reason for, for me um, suggesting that we need to think about this is, is, is as follows. It's true that monkeys and apes have a menstrual cycle, where great apes and chimpanzees and bonobos have a menstrual cycle. But it's also true that the human female menstrual cycle, on average, is exactly the length that you would predict if, in the evolutionary past, the female of the species had gained an advantage, like what we call a fitness advantage, from being able to synchronize with each other using the moon as a clock. So the, the length of the human female cycle, I mean, of course, we all know that when you're young, it's slightly longer. As you grow up in the 40s before menopause, it speeds up a bit. But the, the period of, which kind of matters most from a Darwinian point of view, the, point, the period of a woman's life when she's most likely to be fertile, her cycle is 29.5 days. And as Camilla was pointing out uh, uh, last, last, quite recently, um, it's particularly the case with women who, are, who have a body mass index close to that of hunter-gatherers. So if you're quite lean, women who are quite lean, they, tend to, they have pretty much exactly 29.5 days. And you might say, well, all right, 29.5 days, what's that about? Well, it's 29.5 days. That's the time it takes for the moon to pass through its phases as seen from the Earth. It could be a coincidence. 
And in fact, if we look on Wikipedia, we've, we've had in the radical antibody group, we've had all kinds of battles over this. Wikipedia, the, the dominant consensus is don't worry about it. It's just a coincidence. 29.5 days, 29.5 days. What meaning is there in it? Some, you know, one species is going to have 29.5 days. Well, the thing is that bonobos have a cycle of 40 days in length. Chim common chimpanzees have 36 days. Other primates, other great apes have a quite a close to 29.5 days. Gibbons, it's 28. I think with the orangutans, it's something like 29. So the, the, the menstrual cycle of primates sort of oscillates slightly shorter, slightly longer than that 29.5 day length, which is the length of the, of, of the lunar month. Humans have spot on exactly that length. And um, instead of dismissing it as a coincidence, which it could be, the thing to do, of course, if you're a scientist, is explore whether there might be some adaptive advantage in the past in having a menstrual cycle, which because it's the length of the moon, would mean you could use the moon as your clock in order for women to synchronize their cycles with each other and use that synchrony and use that solidarity and in fact use the signal of blood, maybe amplified, in order to assert power with respect to the opposite, uh, the opposite sex. Um, and so that's the kind of question. Uh, is communism in motion, the, the, right, this periodicity between male rule and female rule, is that the, the system on which we emerge, through which we evolved, and which we're actually most, in, in genetic terms, most closely um, adapted to? I'm just going to see now whether I can just get my PowerPoints up. Um, and I think I should be able to do that. I'm going to share screen. It might be a little bit complicated. Um, and... Uh, Where is this PowerPoint going? I never can, I'm not very good at doing this. Okay, there we are. I think that's it. Why is this gone? Why is this share? Okay, share. Sorry, I say share. So why is it not coming up? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Uh, you're screen sharing. Can you see anything? I can't see where yep. I can't see anything. I'm screen, screen sharing, but the trouble is I can't see my um I can't see what I want to see. Say hi. I don't want to say hi. PowerPoint. We can now we can see your Oh yeah, there we are, there we are, there we are. There we are. I think that's it. Right. Need to start at the beginning, need to start at the beginning. Blah, 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 blah. Right, okay. Right, okay. Now, now why can't I get why do I have do I need to have see me on this thing? Can I get rid of myself? Right, what can you see now? David Graeber. Okay, that's what I want you to see. Right, get rid of it. can I just get this out of the way? Why does it go out of the way? Here we are. So this, Camilla was mentioning the, the tragic death of David Graeber um, at September um, just, uh, uh, this month. And he, he said exactly what we're, we've been saying in, um, in RAG for so many, so many years, why does it keep changing? That anthropology is a discipline terrified of its own potential. It is, for example, he writes in the fragments of an anarchist anthropology, uh, the only discipline in a position to make generalizations about humanity as a whole, since it is on the only discipline that actually takes all of humanity into account, yet it resolutely refuses to do so. And so anthropology, tragically, is one of these oddies. Most people don't even know what it is. It's something like ent entomology or you know, you know, stamp collecting or something. It's only the most important discipline in the sense it's the discipline which connects up all the other disciplines, the natural sciences or the human sciences, studying society today with the society in the past. It's like a cross crossroads of all these different disciplines which can tell us about who we are, clearly of immense social uh, and, and political significance. And yet you wouldn't, you wouldn't think so from the way that most academic anthropologists, at least traditionally, have treated their discipline, writing monographs, coming away from different parts of the world with extraordinary information, and then publishing it in a, in a, you know, in a, in a journal which nobody ever reads, and then the things get, the, you know, the, the monographs get gathered dust in some library. So what we're saying in, in the Radical Anthropology Group, it's about time that this extraordinary knowledge of what it means to be human and all the different opportunities and potentialities which are available to us, it's, a, it's about time this goldmine of information was made public and that we, were, we, we saw that this is a particular way of life which we're kind of, we're, you know, we're stuck in at the moment isn't the only possible one. 
Um, so this is um, a Kalahari woman uh, with her baby, and I won't take very long on it, but the crucial thing is that with hunter-gatherers, you do have a sexual division of labor, and that's because women need to be able to make the men go hunting for them. And if women were to join with the men in the hunt, they wouldn't be able to, the women wouldn't have the solidarity and the control over their own availability to be able to m motivate men to go hunting. And the crucial thing is that with hunter-gatherers, human hunter-gatherers, the men do go hunting, and completely different from what you might think if you're a Darwinian, which is that the men would somehow be selfish, they'd go hunting, they'd probably eat the meat themselves the way common chimps do. Of course, humans are utterly different. Everything's turned completely on its head when the men go away hunting, in this case, killing a Gemsbok. And what do the men do? They bring back the meat. Um, and of course, the women celebrate the fact that the meat's coming back to, to them. And that's, that's called, this system is called bride service. Bride service is a fundamental economic institution of hunter-gatherer society. Men don't go hunting, by the way, to, to eat, because mostly those men that bring back the meat, they won't have any rights to it. It goes to their wives and their in-laws. The reason men go, to, go hunting is to show we are men, because the women will tease them and, and think of them as completely ridiculous kind of people if they can't be bothered to go hunting, or if they were. And if, of course, if they were kind of selfish and went away hunting and the stuff themselves and didn't bring it back, they certainly wouldn't get any sex when they got back home to the camp. This is a completely different picture from a completely different part of the world. This is from the Canela people of the um, highlands of Brazil, northeast highlands of Brazil. And the only reason I've got it here is to show you that it's an example of a village layout and it's in a circle and you see those paths. Those paths are paths where men would crisscross, crisscross, crisscross between these very big long, all those houses around the edge are long houses. They're with extended families run by, by women with support from their brothers. And the reason I'm just showing that is to show what can happen when you have what's called matrilocal residence. Now, it may not, you know, we can argue about whether or not there ever was a matriarchy with women's rule, but there's absolutely no doubt that early human kinship was matrilineal primarily, and that residence was primarily matrilocal because, because bride service doesn't really work any other way. Bride service means the men bring the meat they hunt back to their bride, and she has her mum alongside her and her sisters and her brothers. And it's that solidarity that a woman will have with her kin that enables them to make sure that men, if you like, behave, that they're generous, that they're caring, that they're nurturing, and that they, any meat they get is surrendered. And it just makes it completely impossible for property to accumulate. The, pro the property which a man kind of has, the meat he hunts, is immediately surrendered to his in-laws, and they have the right to distribute it. But another feature of this as well, in any matrilocal system, is that a man always has two homes. He, he, he visits his wife, or his bride. I don't always like the word wife because it's certainly not marriage in the sort of Western sense with a to death to us part with a contract and stuff, but it, he will visit his bride. But he's, he has rights with his sister and his mum. And, and any man in a matrilocal system will be going to and fro, to and fro, crisscrossing between wife, sister, wife, sister, wife, sister. And if his sister, he has his children, his sister's children are his children, and his rights in the food there. And those paths are showing how the people of the East and the people of the West are sort of they're divided into two. The people of the East are married to, as a group, the people of the West. But the men crisscross, crisscross, crisscross. In the evening, they go to stay with their bride, their wife. In the morning, they come back to their sister and discuss family affairs. And, and there's this crisscrossing, crisscrossing from East to West, East to West is, is made manifest in the design of those paths in this beautiful um, circular village. But obviously this kind of village is a, a local thing, but the, pr the principle of matrilocality is certainly is not. And we now have genetic evidence in Africa where we evolved that women over thousands of years, we think probably thousands of years, certainly for a very long time, have been living with mum, living with mum, living with mum. Whereas farmers and, ca and, and pastoralists, people with cattle, it's the other way around, a, a man, um, brings his wife to his own kin. And so he has, he has the power because he's with his own um, relatives uh, and, the, and the wife he's brought in, of course, is all on her own without any kin to support her. Now, this is a picture of a men's house. Um, and, and here, this is from the Sepik Valley, um, Papua New Guinea, that's near the Sepik River. And it will, this will have exactly the features I was telling you about. The men, in this, the men who, who occupy this men's house will be, will be explaining to the boys whom they initiate that this house once belonged to women, and when it belonged to women, it was their menstrual house, and women synchronized their menstruations using the moon as their clock, and by that means um, exercised this um, 
terrifying power which the men today don't want women to regain and the men of course think that there's a terrible danger that women if they're not kept down will or could one day regain the power which they have and this is just a picture of the hindu kush this is this is sort of helping to explain how in in pakistan um women uh, uh, very liberated women with a collective menstrual house so-called pagans by the way can constantly the pakistani tourist industry calls them pagans the whole time but it's sort of this helps you to understand why in those valleys very very much cut off they've been able to maintain their gender equality and freedom in a in a, in a region which of course is uh, in other in, in, in so many other ways um uh, patriarchal um and this is these are the women concerned these are kashali and on the bottom corner, left-hand corner, is the book, Are Women Are Free? Gender and uh, Ethnicity in the Hindu Kush by Win, uh, Win Maggie. Um, now, completely different, moving along, very, very different. Now, we're moving to Northeast Ireland and Australia. And the point I want this slide to make is simply that, in this part of the world, in Australia, where women still have quite a lot of solidarity, this particular part of Australia, uh, in, in the north, and uh, of, of Northeast Ireland, and, the women, makes, the women make string figures is, a, is the thing which women do when they go into menstrual seclusion during their women's initiation rituals, but also just as a pastime. And many, many of the string figures symbolize have, you know, women, three women looking after a baby, women helping to care for one another's babies uh, and, and receiving meat and sharing it out and so on. But one of the sort of stock motifs, one of the stock um, images that you make that you portray using the string figure is menstrual blood of three women and an associated myth states that string figures were invented by two sisters who in a ritual act sat down looking at each other with their feet out and legs apart and both menstruated then they put string loops made of one another's menstrual blood around their necks and um, if you look at aboriginal australian art very often the motif in the myths is two sisters Two sisters were the dreamtime sisters, goddesses who constructed the landscape, invented languages, marked out the, the different um, song lines, um, and, and founded, established the, the sacred rituals. And this is from um, Pilbara region in, um, in Western Australia. And what you can see is these women um, with zigzaggy, I hope you can see zigzaggy lines of power coming from their, from their vaginas, from between their legs. And, 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 and I mean, what do you think about this picture? I mean, if you didn't know of the possibility of menstrual synchrony, you wouldn't know what to make of that picture. These are women who are clearly female, they've got breasts, they've got this kind of spear indicating their, their, their females with a sort of masculine uh, role they're playing and the power that they have comes from, um, from their, their mens what I would call their menstrual synchrony or solidarity. That's another way of, of delineating that same kind of connecting us through the blood. And here's a whole lot more um, images. And, and you note that the, the, this, the, the blood forms a loop. So women together get swallowed up in loops of this blood. And I've only just found out recently um, that an artist, a Chilean revolutionary artist, socialist artist, um, Cecilia Vincuna, Vincuna, Vincuna um, helps a lot of her art has been um, based on that image of those two sisters who synchronize their menstruation and Cecilia and the artist uses these red cords, these red um, cords of wool to, to, to try to protect areas of mountain and glaciers uh, from um, the, the, the depredations of, of corporations. And, uh, so what, what we're seeing here is the idea, the fundamental idea, fundamental to all the world's religions, some things are sacred and nothing is more sacred than the bodies of you know, humans and, and women especially need that idea that some things are sacred and again nothing is more sacred um, than than the blood which connects which can connect women together and this is just um, this is from the ice age this is from a place called La Lind upper Paleolithic Europe showing two women dancing and again if you didn't know if you didn't have in your mind the concept of menstrual synchrony I'm not sure that you'd be able to work out what on earth this image could be about. It's showing two women dancing and they seem to be connected um, at that region from which um, birth, life, blood uh, flows. So for me, you can't prove that it's menstrual synchrony, but as soon as you try to think of alternatives, you've kind of lost your words and it's certainly consistent with that, um, with that idea. And I'm gonna <laughs> end up now. Um, okay, 
this is part of a much longer argument, of course, but there is the, if you want to know why it was that we humans became lunar, why we evolved in syncing with the moon, and why in particular women developed a cycle, enabling them to synchronize with each other using the moon as a clock, it's actually because of the lines. So um, uh, from about two or three million years ago, as we were coming more, maybe a little bit more actually, as we were moving out from relatively sheltered forest areas into, into wetlands and savannah, the main predators would have been big cats. And they loved to, uh, I'll just, perhaps I'll just read, read this out. This is from a, 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 an amazing article by the naturalist, uh, uh, Craig Packer and his um, African colleagues. Nocturnal carnivores are widely believed to have played an important role in human evolution, driving the need for melt, nighttime shelter, the control of fire, and our innate fear of darkness. We, and his team, performed an extensive analysis of predatory behavior across the lunar cycle on the largest data set of lion attacks ever assembled, and found that African lions are as sensitive to moonlight when hunting as humans as when hunting herbivores, and that lions are most dangerous to humans when the moon is faint or below the horizon. And just one more. Using the largest data set ever recorded, a thousand lion attacks on humans across Tanzania between 1988 and 2009, the studies showed that on moonless nights, people across rural areas are significantly more likely to be killed and eaten by a lion. Um, I'm going to see if I can stop. I want to stop screen sharing. Uh, how do I stop screen sharing? Stop sharing. There we are. That's, that should do it. Um, and um, get back to this. Okay. So, what seems to have happened is that once a month at Dark Moon, in the course of evolution, women would have needed to make sure they weren't eaten by a lion. I mean, to sort of simplify. And the way in which you do that is, so, is to form a big group and to sing. Uh, and we know that from Jerome Lewis's work, which you'll hear about a little bit later at this term. The kind of singing which these hunter-gatherers do is called polyphonic singing. And it, what it does, it makes, it makes 10 women sound like 20 or 30 and the lions and the lions don't want to mess with a bunch of women who seem to be very organized. Uh, and the women themselves, as I think, I hope Jerome will be explaining, he asked them, why do you sing all night at Dark Moon? Uh, and they said, we're singing, singing for our lives. Um, and I know that Camilla has sort of similar experience with the Hadza, who's, who also have their major rituals at Dark Moon and sing all through the night. And on one occasion, Camilla was mentioning um, that the women sort of imagined possibly true, possibly not true, that there was a leopard nearby. But when they sing together, they feel safe because they're, they're giving a signal to the dangerous animals, kind of don't mess with us. Um, and this has to be lunar because it's the, when it's the dark moon, which the, the predators, because they have fantastic night vision and we've got no it's useless night vision, it's at the time of dark moon that you need to gather together and sing. And, and, it, and of course, it, then it would make a lot of sense if you're going to be menstruating to be doing so at that period when you're when you're being when you're being protected, it, it, it would make much less sense to menstruate at full moon. Um, and there's a, there's a reason why this movement between dark moon and full moon, waxing and waning, um, became the the, the 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 rhythm of hunter gatherer life. And we are still essentially adapted to that rhythm. We've forgotten it. We've got street lighting. We've got light pollution. We've got permanent marriage. We've got all sorts of things which sort of cut against that. Um, but we we are essentially creatures who evolved with our environment and the moon in Africa in, in, in alignment with what the, <laughs> the lions were doing shaped the fact that we, we end up with this length of cycle which enables us to, in principle, enables us to synchronize. And just the last thing to say perhaps is that this was actually not just an evolutionary thing. Once, when, we, when we became human in this sense and women learned to synchronize and derive power from it, that wasn't just evolution, that was a, a revolutionary change. It established the most fundamental thing really, which is that some things are sacred, um, the body most of all. Um, and I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Chris. We've run a little long, but I think it was worth it for all those amazing images. Um, can, can I invite anybody who'd like to ask questions or make points? Um, and you can unmute yourself. <laughs> should be able to unmute yourself um, if we need to. I should say thank you very much for listening for so long. I can see 56 of you are still here. And yeah, I we'll do apologize, it went on a bit long. I just thought I'd treat you to those stories in some detail at the beginning. <clears throat> you can unmute. Make points.
perhaps I should stress as well, this, this theory is, it's, it's not really mainstream. It's hard to be, you know, I mean, all kinds of reasons why scientists have the, suffer from the same taboos as other people and don't really want to talk about these things. So I, I'm hoping and expecting you to be pretty, um, pretty upfront and critical because this, this, this theory is um, new and different. <laughs> Complete silence. <laughs> Stunned everybody. <laughs> You're allowed to be quite rude, by the way, if you don't like it, if you think it's all complete nonsense. <clears throat> quite possibly, yes, yeah, somewhere. Um, yes, you must be able to unmute Ronan. Why aren't you un allowed to unmute? Where's Ronan? Ronan can't unmute. Mute. Um, really? ask to unmute more. Blur. Uh, yes, yeah, the host has allowed it now. Sorry, I'm going to be very brave and ask. This is my first attendance at one of these things, but I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, yeah, obviously, the, the, the um, the theories you're talking about have a sort of a lot of disciplines involved in them. I'm just wondering to what extent it's a sort of scientifically um, falsifiable theory and to what extent it depends on sort of things we could discover from biology. So basically, if we found, if it was a sort of conclusive um, proof in biology that you couldn't, um, that there is no synchronicity and that it isn't, it isn't dependent on the lunar cycle, um, to what extent would that affect the theory? Or, or does it not actually depend on something that you can prove in, in biological terms? Very, very, very good question. And I'm glad you asked it. In science, you don't really prove things you try to disprove them. And of course, a good theory is one which is detailed and specific enough to be vulnerable to empirical falsification. Um, this is the only theory I'm aware of, which makes very, very detailed specifications about what you can find and can't find, or shouldn't, should find or shouldn't find in mythology, in ritual, in archaeology, in genetics, in a range of areas. It specifies in, in very great detail, and certain things will never happen in the myth, any magical myth. Um, there will never be, you know, a story of a, you know, the, the ideal time to get married is when you're, when you're bleeding or a, a dark moon, for example. I mean, so marriage is always linked with full moon, menstruation is dark moon, is the raw and the cooked, all the things which Levi Strauss um, discussed in his in extraordinary book *Mythologique*. But there's also consistencies in. In, in, in ritual, including, of course, hunting ritual. So find me a single culture in the world where the, the best thing to do for a man to make sure he's got good, good luck in the hunt is to have sex with his wife the night before. Um, because we're saying that the whole point is that you, you deny men uh, sex to make sure they've got an incentive to go, not only go away and hunt and bring back the meat. That's the whole logic of what's called bride service. So, I mean, I mean I, and I could go on and go on and on and go on. I mean, the thing is, this is the most exquisitely in detail, falsifiable theory. In terms of biology, again, it's, uh, in, it's extremely falsifiable. So, I mean, what we're saying is that menstrual synchrony is possible, is theoretically possible. Now, of course, to do that, you'd actually have to start, you know, you'd have to sort of find some society or some group of people where they could actually start to synchronize their periods. Now, that is actually very difficult. Um, and the reason it's difficult is because it, it, it's such a sensitive thing that the, 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 the female, cycle is so susceptible to psychology, to light presence, to whether you're having sex or not, all sorts of things. So many things can go wrong. And I will, I will be upfront with you, there's not a single society in the world today where women, despite being very close to each other, regularly synchronize their cycles with one another. The, the most we've got to it is the fact that we have a length of cycle, which would make it possible, I mean, or rather, to put it a different way, <laughs> We have the length of cycle which you would predict if menstrual synchrony were adaptive in the past. But of course, part of the idea is that the, the, the synchronized menstrual cycle is dependent on a very slow rhythm of hunting. You have to be able to have a hunt once a month and have enough to survive on for a month once you've made your kill. So, of course, if when we were hunting mammoths, you hunt a mammoth, you, you're made, you know, you don't need to keep hunting. But today, in most hunter gatherer societies, you can't really afford to do that. So, I mean, it, there's many, many ways in which it's, it's falsifiable. On the simple question of, of matriarchy, 
again, I can't understand why everyone's assuming, and, and it's still sort of mainstream, that somehow male sexual dominance is the sort of default for humans. Because actually we're just as closely related to bonobos as to common chimpanzees. Many people think we're cl more closely related. And we are in terms of many aspects of behavior and, and morphology and, and stuff. And of course, um, bonobos, which of course, as you know, chimpanzees, species of chimpanzee, because they live south of the Congo River, where resources are very um, rich and abundant, the females can forage together. Uh, they, they bond with each other through their GT grubbing. Any, any group of females having you know, chimps, or female bonobos having problems with a male would just do a bit of Gigi rubbing, bond together and beat him up. <laughs> bonobos are emphatically matriarchal. So, um, and that, of course that doesn't mean humans, early humans were, but it does mean that the, 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 there's nothing genetic about the gender uh, structure of early hominins. I mean, you know, genetically, well, bonobos are, are the same basically as, as, as common chimps, almost identical but slightly different um, environmental circumstances can tip from a very male-dominated common chimpanzee to a, a female-dominated uh, bonobo. And so we need to be open-minded about gender in the evolutionary past in a way that at the moment, um, I'm afraid that, that you know, that we're not. I mean, the overwhelming dominant story is that we're, we're closer to chimpanzees and that male dominance has been the, the norm throughout evolution and history. And um, we, uh, Jacob had a hand up. Can you talk, Jacob? Are you muted? Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Oh, oh Jacob, hello. <laughs> hello, hello. Um, I was wondering, um, in terms of the menstrual hut or the women's house, um, my mind's going even further back to the development of home base. Yeah. Uh, and that that would have been the territory of the women yeah. uh, and, and the children. Yeah. Um, and then the cultivation of fire, ceramics, and symbolic art, um, which synchrony would be in the ochre, um, and being able to create a, a, the synchrony, the symbol of body painting that we are all bleeding and we are off limits. Um, but that that the the male of the species would not have a chance to create a, a house or a home or even ritual uh, to give significance to the blood. So. Would you track it back that far? Yes, I mean, um, of course, hunter gatherers are not sedentary. You you move, you move, you move, you you, you eat. Out. As far as the gathering is concerned, the women would definitely want to move relatively frequently, but of course, less frequently than other um, primates, because of course, if the males are bringing back food from a very wide area, the females can be relatively. Um, residentially stable, getting the males to go around over a very wide distance. But in Africa, we don't seem to see much evidence of structured hearths until really quite recently. So in the early stages of evolution, it looks as if because the women would have moved after a few weeks, probably, um, it wasn't really worth investing in the, all the labor in an effort to you know, dig a hole, line it with stones and make a sort of, make a proper oven or fire. So, uh, and the ceramic thing, I think, isn't wouldn't have been there early. I'm, although I'm not sure. I suppose just baking some mud and making dolls and things like that had to do may have been may have been going on. But it's an interesting question, and I probably I'm not the one to answer the question. I'm probably Camilla and maybe Ian Watts know more about these issues of early evolution than I do. Then if Camilla wants to. Um, uh, sorry, the issue. Sorry, I was on the chat with the issue being. Well, the issue, the, just, just the issue is whether the, the women's menstrual hut was the home base. Oh, the home base. At, at the early stages. Uh, um, um, it, it, uh, it's I, would, I would say no, because the, uh, the, the, uh, the lemur is a special hut con constructed for the occasion. Isn't yeah, it? It, 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 yeah the, in the rituals, they are kind of making extra special... Um, places, but I, I, I don't see in principle why why that mightn't be the situation. Um, it's yeah, you'd have to look at what is the archaeology of what's being kept in mm. the home bases, and there might be some support for that for Upper Paleolithic archaeology. Mm. Um, I, I'm guessing a bit here, but yeah, hadn't hadn't kind of thought of that, but. Um, the 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 timing of send because usually when the menstrual rituals are happening that's not because that's 
dark moon, that isn't the time that the men would go away hunting yet. So being home, I don't know. Yeah. Um, Amy wants to come in. Right, Amy and then Jake. Yeah. Can you unmute, Amy? Oh, there we go. Thank you. Um, thinking about this question about biology and the conversation in the chat um, and the work of Brianna Foz, who's mostly in gender studies and has written on sort of this quest that science has right now to disprove synchrony and that um, like a, several of the scientists working against it or on it are, are men who had previous specialties. Um, but also this question of like why there's this need to prove something biologically as opposed to the synchrony first being a like cultural and symbolic that it's not always um, the physical blood. And I'm sure that that's something that Camilla will probably talk about later in the term, but that, um, that the solidarity and the synchrony isn't always a physical biological bleeding and that the synchrony evolves through cultural practice, um, not just how the body works Camilla, biologically. Camilla and I always have slightly different angles on this. Camilla tends to sort of say, well, it, it doesn't really matter whether you're really synchronizing as long as the men think you are and you've got all your ochre all over your body which I agree with and I, of course I agree that it's extremely improbable that women could really stay in strict synchrony given miscarriages and you know all sorts of other things still births and stuff I don't know um, you know uh, so but I, I still think that the, none of this none of this cultural synchrony would have been possible with a different body so if the human female body was anything remotely like um, bonobo or chimpanzee with a 36 day cycle or a 40 day cycle or, or you know 23 day cycle as some monkeys have it wouldn't have been possible and it must it must be relevant and I know Camilla agrees with me on this it must be relevant that the cycle length 29.5 days is, is what you predict if synchrony was advantageous and again as Camilla points out it's not just the menstrual cycle length it's the the pregnancy the duration of pregnancy is, is an exact 9 to 12 multiple of the lunar length so that even even so that it would be perfectly possible for a, a kind of lunar clock in the body somewhere to be ticking away, ticking away, ticking away through the, the relatively brief period when hunter gathered women would have been cycling. Wouldn't be cycling for very long because you're going to get pregnant quite soon. And then, of course, you have your pregnancy when you stop cycling, but the, the clock's still ticking away. And then it's breastfeeding, the clock probably still ticking away, especially as the moon's still up there, of course. And then when you do resume, when you wean the child and you resume cycling, um, there's, there's a, a good chance that your, your body will be still in sync with the moon. With this length of cycle, with any other length, it would be difficult. I mean, it would be impossible. In fact. So I, I don't want to minimize the biology of it. Hmm. Yeah. Any other questions? I don't think I've got need to add at this stage. Um, Susie Crockford has said, my experience of being with groups of women is that if we spend long enough together, our cycles will synchronize. It makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. So I, again, every, every group of women that we've, we've had lectures will, will always say that. And um, the trouble is that sort of many white coats, the skeptics will just sort of say, well, yeah, but you know, you only remember the times when you synchronized. When you didn't, it wasn't an event, so you forgot all about it. And it's all been biased and you only want to synchronize. And there's a whole lot of literature, of course, these days about how, how the, the idea of synchronizing has become a, quite a strong cultural current in, in, in the West. Um, and not just in the West, in, in other parts, in China as well, apparently. So that women are really interested in whether they synchronize. And if they do, celebrate it and, and, and kind of, you know, feel a, a, a power from it. Um, but it has to be admitted that um, uh, the statistics haven't, haven't always been, um, you know. No, they're, they're so beyond the capacity of science to demonstrate synchrony. Whoops. 
it, it's beyond scientific capacity to demonstrate synchrony, but women all over the world believe in synchrony is, um, <laughs> is the truth. <laughs> Um, another thing to say, though, is that um, we in the West, this, this thing about menstrual synchrony is also very much driven by the fact that Western women today, or Western lifestyle women today, have more periods than any women at any part of history or prehistory ever did, because we have very late first births, we have early onset of menarche, we have hardly any breastfeeding, relatively speaking, and fewer children. And so we just have lots of menstrual cycles, maybe four or five times as much as traditional bush living hunter-gatherer women. So there's just a lot more menstrual cycles um, behind this. So actually women are experiencing that. And if they're experiencing more menstrual cycles, they must be overlapping menstrual cycles. It just makes sense. Yeah. Um, so they're expressing and they're, they're out in public in like working offices and maybe not so much this time, but they're, they're, they're in spaces where they're sharing a lot of, of that experience. So it's the reality, you know, whatever the <laughs> scientists say. <laughs> so that's why women think the scientists are nuts. We've got quite a few questions in the, any, in the chat, haven't we? We've got do hunter gatherers have any forms of birth control? Does it factor into these rituals? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. The, ma the main form of birth control for hunter-gatherer women in traditional circumstances is just energy, is just the fact that, um, you know, for, uh, in societies where there, there isn't like supermarket shelves stacked with huge amounts of fat and sugar, um, a woman breastfeeding, um, a woman pregnant and breastfeeding is going to have very high energy requirements and she's not going to start menstrual cycles again until after weaning and she's breastfeeding for a very long time. So basically breastfeeding takes, so for women in certain Kalahari, Jean Trois women, uh, four year into birth intervals, quite the, the normal um, for traditional bush living. With the Hudza, it would be a bit under three years, but that's reflecting different environments. Um, so, so yeah, that that is a that space is birth. Just the sheer energy requirement. We'll hear more about energy requirements. So, Anska and us. So, do we have any references for the idea that women are singing for their lives, and that that mobbing theory for the origin of singing is in a, in some papers? I, the, the strange thing is, it's only Jerome and I who have come up with this theory relatively recently. I don't think Jerome specifically referred to it in a paper. I may be wrong, but the, but what I do know is that Wild Voices, which is a paper about the origin of language in song, published, written by myself and Jerome Lewis, what was it, tw is it 2017, I think? So I mean, current anthropology, if you just look up Wild Voices, current anthropology, yeah, you'll find it. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's the nearest I think that we've got to um, sort of references to that idea. And we have found actually that quite a few hunter-gatherers in different parts of the world, not just the, the Central African rainforest, say the women will say the reason why we sing is, is to keep safe. We're singing for our lives to chase the animals away. And it's not just Central Africa, the Kalahari Bushmen. They also say, the women say, the reason they sing, very, very similar kind of singing, is to keep the lions at bay. Yeah. So that's in that Wild Voices paper, but only a rather yeah. brief. The, the women and the lions kind of sing to each other. The women <coughs> and the lions have to sing to each other because, yeah. um, because uh, the only sounds that carry across the desert are the, the women's voices and then the lions roaring back and yeah. it can carry for kilometers and kilometers across. The and the, lion, the lionesses, they, they themselves um, synchronize their babies oh, yeah. and, and their voices, of course, they sing in choruses because the, the females don't want a, a, a rogue male coming along and killing their, 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 their cubs. And so they'll, they'll sing to keep the, their own species, their males of their own species, who can be a pest, of course, and keep them away. So humans and lions are very interestingly symmetrical opposites, and therefore almost identical in so many ways. Humans and lions are really very similar uh, and co-evolved co very closely in Africa. <coughs> Any more questions? Don't if we can. Can we unmute Pete? Can you unmute everyone? Oh, I, uh, well, I'd, I don't uh, 
I can ask people to unmute if they want to speak. Ask all to unmute. All right, there. Oh, yeah. I, I didn't realize. I'm so sorry, Paul. I'm so sorry. I could have done it earlier. Ask all to unmute. It, I have now. Hi, anymore. Unmuted you all, and it seems to be fine. Yep. Um, you've still got forty-two <laughs> people, and it's um, it's a lot actually, forty-two. <clears throat> any further queries so can i can i just say that the 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 thing about blood and and churches is quite interesting because of course in these men's houses men were menstruating and anyone who's been brought up as i have as a, as a catholic will know that the church um has as its ultimate secret a certain kind of divine blood and uh, these you know if this argument has got any force there's just a continuity between the original menstrual blood and then the different kinds of male divinities who bleed and, and who have to bleed in order to be powerful. Um, and so there's, I, I don't know, it just seems to me it really starts to put a huge lot of things together, this idea. Somebody sneezed, and when you sneeze, your picture suddenly comes up big on my screen. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's worth saying on the subject of matriarchy stories, because there was a, a feminist anthropologist, uh, uh, Joan Bamberger, early 70s, at the time of a kind of wave of feminist anthropology. Yeah, also near here. Um, who um, the rope, but I think she's moved. Can you stop? Whoever's got their back on, I'm going to mute this one. Right, mute, muting. <laughs> Naughty people who talk. Um, just to say about Joan Bamberger, that she was analysing the uh, 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 matriarchy myths, particularly Amazon region, and regarded them as completely male ideology, and that they were used as justificate texts of justification for male hierarchy, um, secret society versus women, and that there was absolutely no truth to them that they should all be kind of just junked and not, and, and nobody should, no feminist should be misled to think that there really was some kind of matriarchy. Um, it's also interesting that, well, well, that position doesn't really explain why there is such an elaboration of male imitation of menstruation because I mean if, if men were naturally so powerful and always so dominant what are they doing with all this imitation of menstruation going on and um, the other thing to say is that amongst very egalitarian societies we still do get these matriarchy stories and and when we hear from Jerome on um, Ngoku for the Bayaka people. Um, also, I could talk about the Hadza. They have matriarchy stories where women were the original owners. And these are acted out, these stories get acted out in the female initiation ceremonies and the male initiation ceremonies. So they're kind of returning to the original stage of matriarchy when they're doing initiations. Um, and yet these are extremely egalitarian people. And, and not, it isn't the case that men are establishing a, a hierarchy they may be trying to but it's much more it's much more in the way that chris is talking a sort of balance um with the men taking power than the women taking power it's much more like that um, so it's hard to just point to the matriarchy stories and say that is showing a male takeover it, it exists in still quite a, a very egalitarian groups as well and of course, remember as well that there's, there's usually a, a male version of the story, mm. and a female and version a female of the story. Counter version. Of and of course, nearly all the versions we have have been taken by anthropologists from the men. Um, and because women have got other things to do than talk to an anthropologist. Um, but if you do talk to the, <laughs> if you do, do talk to the women, they will contradict the men's story, and they will say, "No, no, no. We we gave this stuff to men. To men. We were, you know, we kept all the most important secrets to ourselves." And this, this nonsense the men talk about how they stole everything, uh, you know, let them try. They may have taken a few things, but um, they've got a completely different angle um, the women have from the men's version. And it's just a shame that so many of the stories, the version we've got are just the male version of, of it all, male perspective on everything.
know, the men love to think that they're, you know, powerful and dominant and put women in their place and all that stuff. <clears throat> but it's equally true, of course, that the women, the women can be pretty, um, um, <laughs> pretty forceful as well when they do something like Nagoku, they'll, they'll very much want to put men in their place and, um, and tease the men and mock them and all sorts of, you know, not being much good in bed and all sorts of, I mean, really, you know, the men, the women will be very, um, very sexually provocative and um, mutual insults. <laughs> that's right. The two, the two. That's the lovely thing about it. You've got the two the women's camp and the men's camp. It's a kind of battle of the sexes, but it's playful. At the end of the day, it's playful, and each each gender group, sort of, at the end of the day, more or less has to put up with with all the insults. <laughs> um, Brett's just put a big question uh, on the chat. Why don't the patriarchal societies just forget about the blood and bury it? <laughs> Wouldn't they like to do that? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. It's just that, um, in a, uh, it's, it's the way I see it is that it, it sort of happens fairly, fairly gradually. And um, so you've got a society where blood is just, I don't know, it's the ultimate taboo. It's, you, if you want to make a rule, you want to demarcate a space or a time, you just need blood to do it. And that's how things have always been. And, and if you just, as you say here, bury it and forget about it, uh, well, I don't know, how, how do you make a rule? I mean, in the past, rules have been made, like written in blood. And uh, it was just much easier for men to sort of say, yeah, but our blood can do it as well. And initially, I mean, one of the things I, because I, did, I realized I was taking a bit too much time, I, 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 I missed out something I often do, which is to, to, there's a lovely a whole section of, um, I could have read, read out, uh, about the Yurok um, uh, Indians of, um, of, of, of Northwest America, the Yurok River, where the women do their synchronized menstruation. They go up to the sacred moontime pond and they perform their rituals of purification. And the men, they, they scratch their legs until they bleed and they, and they, they go into their sweat lodge. So um, I, 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 can you see what I'm saying? I'm saying that the, at, at, with the Yurok, at least as far as we can see, um, the men ended up with the sweat lodge and the blood actually taking the place of the women's. But up to, in the early stages, there would have been the, the men doing their initiations, the women doing theirs, a bit of both. And, and it's just the language of ritual, the language of power, the language of everything, really, of mythology, was a language of blood. And it's, when, when it's your language, you all have to speak it. And to simply get into a completely different language without any blood it was evidently difficult. And even today, in, in you know Christianity, but many other religions as well, of course, uh, you know, and, and it's just just think about the laws of Kashrut, or meat being kosher, or, or or halal or something. It's all all these things about what you can eat and what you can't eat. All about whether in the during the killing of the animal, um, the blood was respected. All blood belongs to the Lord in, in these you know religion Abrahamic religions. So, and, and and it isn't just that either. As soon as you get to Hindu religions and other you know religions, you just find. The blood of women and animals is the, is ultimately the source of taboo, um, and it's just bury it and forget about it. It's a nice idea, Brett, <laughs> but evidently people just couldn't quite do that. I think everything would have fallen apart. There wouldn't have been any kind of grammar or laws or rules or taboos if they'd just done that and forgot about it. Mm. Yeah. It's a very good question. Uh, yeah. Mm. <laughs> any? Any more questions? We can maybe. Um, we've, anybody else? Check it. Camilla, I was thinking about your decolonizing time uh, lecture and the power of um, syncing up not only with uh, female solidarity and then male as a reflect male solidarity as a reflection of female ritual power. Uh, but also having that connected ecologically and cosmologically, um, and that that is the ba that's centering around um, the creation of life. And as long as we are in a life and death cycle, um, I think human beings are going to be pretty concerned about uh, where life comes from and how does it continue um, mm -hmm. biologically and culturally. And the blood is the signal. Mm -hmm. um, and so the church. It's interesting. Chris brings up the church because the church took had to make it emphatically clear that it did like the virgin mary was a virgin 
she's the Immaculate Conception means unspotted. Unspotted yep. takes us to taboo. She has none of the bloods, menstruation, right. deflowering, childbirth. She, all her blood has gone to Jesus instead, yeah. basically. Yeah. And she stands underneath the cross where he is bleeding. No. Right, and then Jesus' is sacrifice, mythologically being the last blood La sacrifice. Yeah. And so, last sacrifice. And so we're done. Yeah. Yep. The men are done. We don't, don't like, everybody. He's done it for everybody. But you right. still have to have Holy Communion with the body and blood of Jesus. Yes. Yeah. Symbolically, but the the West isn't believing anymore. Uh, but no. but the the consequence is the rest of the world is believing. Mm, sure. um, mm -hmm. So it's it's very interesting Brett's question. But I think I think we see what the, how just how far the patriarchy has gone mm. with the blood. Yeah. Um, and then we have we have a good fifteen hundred years of evidence of what that does to a culture. But one one of the books, many books, I didn't write. <laughs> I was very unlikely to get round to it. Is the is this one about yeah. as you mentioned Jesus and and um, because of course uh, you're you're so right. There was a, obviously a huge pressure for a peasant economy for for people to be able to you know raise a goat a, a, a bull uh, and kill it and eat it and not have to take it all to the temple and perform a sacrifice, uh, allowing of course the priests to you know carve off quite a substantial amount of it. So, earnings from these you know so you had in you had in of course uh, in, in, in Jerusalem this massive massive temple which was designed with all the gutters and gullies and drains to sort of endlessly flowing blood 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 flowing all over the place uh, and, and of course the, the way to get rid of all that and uh, it was to sort of say well you know we've we've, we've got the, the ultimate sacrifice this 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 guy jesus he's he's done the sacrifice for all time and then one of the reasons why it would be so popular was because then everyone else could say okay we can kill and eat we can kill animals and eat them uh, uh we don't need to perform it as a sacrifice which are very costly i mean the very word sacrifice is telling you it's costly so christianity was a was a, a like a, a a way of avoiding a huge cost of having to sacrifice every animal you, you know, to the priest before you could eat it, because it just meant that you couldn't eat it yourself, of course. And, and uh, so anyway, I just say, I wish somebody would <laughs> write the book I never wrote. Well, there is also another question on Christianity from Andre, who's saying, well, what about the Orthodox Church, where women who are menstruating aren't even allowed in the church? Well, that's part of the course. I mean, that, that wherever you have these men's houses, men can menstruate, but women, when they do it, but you, you really get out the way, do it somewhere else, you know, don't because come near a, us. A real menstruating woman would threaten to actually show up the pretenses of the men. I mean, the last thing you want, if you want to really s explain the extraordinary potency of Jesus's blood, is for the sort of real thing to turn up in that church. I mean, you know, some have this, the absolute incompatibility of menstruation with the holy blood. Is is just is just the is the you know menstruation would be the ultimate sort of antimatter. You've got matter and antimatter, and 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 one would just annihilate the other. Um, so keep those keep those women away because they're they're the greatest possible threat to the. Um, you know the, the dogma that this blood, Jesus's blood, is, is, is gives you salvation. Hey, Amy, you had another question. That was suggestion. Amy. Um, yeah. Um, first, sort of along these lines of like, we no longer have to bleed because Jesus bled. Um, like there are many perspectives that even in women. Um, not bleeding in the earth, not using menstrual cups, but using like tampons and sanitary napkins are, they're even getting away from their own blood. And then with men not bleeding, we see that in the reality through genocide. Like the, the blood comes in other ways because yeah. as individuals were either not bleeding or not connected to the bleeding and, and what the bleeding means. Um, so this conversation was making me think about that, but I wanted to go back to the Uruk and um, what Chris was saying about their um, male menstruation. And what's really striking to me in Buckley's research is that the, the men are cutting themselves to achieve this spiritual cleansing and, and to achieve this 
spiritual state that they can't be in when they're not bleeding and that simultaneously when the women are bleeding, they have to be in seclusion because it's unclean, but it's also the time they're at the height of their power. Mm. So it's such a moment of the men are mimicking what the women are achieving naturally because without bleeding, they can't achieve that spiritual state, mm. um, which I think is a really yeah, good point. Beautifully put, yeah, beautifully put, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Trying to prove on that. I'd, yeah. I'd just say though that what men, are, what women are achieving naturally, I don't think there's very much that's, not, there's so much that's cultural about the Yurok women's practices that of course there uh, it's there is a bi there's a biological veracity there but but it's really fully cultural and and it's a little bit of a trap to fall into nature culture there because this ritual menstrual synchrony is like the in, the absolute establishment of culture so yeah just just put that but otherwise yes, yeah, but the, yes. the word natural it can apply to a point with the women, but it can't at all to any point whatsoever with the men. I mean, it is utterly unnatural for men to menstruate. It is utterly unnatural for men to give birth. You can't say it's unnatural for women. So I, I'm supporting Amy a bit there. Of course, it's cultural as well, hugely. Uh, it doesn't sort of, just doesn't happen. Uh, and we know a little bit about what has to be done to get the synchrony maximised. You, you know, I mean, I, I wish, I sort of wish we could start the revolution and. Uh, uh, I, to me, it seems fairly clear that if women, it's a, everything's against it. But I mean, in all, because, partly because if, in order for women to start the revolution, you'd have to sort of, you'd have to keep away from your husband, the dark moon or your boyfriend. Uh, make sure you don't go out in the light, shut, shut the curtains, make sure you have lots and lots of sex around for full moon when you don't, don't only have lots of sex, but also have a bonfire or stay out in the, all night with a full moon. I mean, there's so many things you'd have to do in your life which involve other people. I, as far as we can tell, knowing you know the actual sort of effects of physical stimuli on the on the hormonal system, that it would be really difficult to do that without a massive social and political cultural revolution going on all around you, so that men themselves began to see that actually there's something in it for them as well, which there would be of course because there'd be a you know, huge amount of other things you can do besides having you know, occasional sex with your wife or something. It's all kinds of amazing forms of bonding and other kinds of sex which can go on during these sacred periods which we, we know very little of in our culture we just think there's a thing called sex and that's it <clears throat> and other things which are not really quite up to it because there's no sex involved those hunter gatherers have a, a much wider sort of palette and um, to choose from in terms of different kinds of physical intimacy and, and uh, so on So, um, Irene is really we're coming up to uh, well, we're coming up to one to eight thirty. They're talking right. about. Um, it's interesting that they're talking about how different Orthodox traditions are about uh, about menstruation in church. That it's variable, and it would be really interesting to work out why there's differences and, and variability in that. Um, but we're coming up to 8.30. Uh, we've still got a lot of people here. If there's still anybody dying to ask questions. Um, but we could perhaps roll it for next week because Chris is going to um, expound on the, his basic theory from the classic theory from blood relations, the sex strike theory. Um, and there'll be a lot more questions and perhaps especially questions about the testability of the theory that Ronan was bringing up. Um, is there anybody you'd really like to ask any more now, um, or should we wind that up? Okay, thanks so, so much, all of you. Great, all, all 40 of you are still here, so um, I know it's a bit yeah, tiring to of... Zoom things, especially when someone's going on for quite a while. So, great. Yeah, thank you very much for, for your attention. Um, oh, it yeah. is meant to be eight. 30. Now, Katrin, where are you seeing different start times? It's meant to be 18.30 each week. Um, thank you for reminding uh, There's some tidying up on the website to do in that case. If it ever says 18.45, it's wrong, but I need to correct that. You're quite right. Yes, we moved it forward. Um, Facebook's have 18.30, I'm sure, and the Eventbrite also, I hope so. Um, but that's the idea, 18.30 to 20.30, and we'll change that with the flip to Greenwich Mean Time, UTC, when, it, when that happens the end of October. OK. 
Okay. Okay, everybody. Great. Thank That's you.